my name is Austin Allen. I work with the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Lake County. Um, we're out of Roman, uh, and I've been there for the last three years. Um, I'll just give you a little bit about my background, just, just so you know where I'm at and where my knowledge base is. Um, I grew up in South Carolina in a small town. Um, my grandparents were tobacco farmers, and um, I loved growing things. Like as far back as I can remember, I always had a pumpkin patch. One year, my aunt Becky started growing some buckwheat and red clover as a cover crop uh, when I was 12. And I'm 36 now, so that tells you kind of how long I've been interested in this. Um, I started growing red clover in between my pumpkin rows just because I thought it was a pretty flower. I didn't know what it was doing, but I grew it just because I thought it was cool and I, my Aunt Becky was really cool, so I'm going to be like her. So um, that was the first cover crop I can remember planting. Um, from then, I went to school at MSU. Got to have a degree in soil science, soil and water science there. Um, I've worked with some not-for-profits after that, with work in Mongolia with herders. Um, after that, I worked for a seed potato farm in Bozeman, outside of Bozeman, and we had some organic potatoes, and we also had some conventional potatoes. But um, I was there for five years, so I learned to love farming uh, in that regard. And then um, managed an experimental farm in Washington. Um, and we looked at specifically cereals and interceding legumes in between them to try to get a variety of roots growing in the ground. We were looking at the effects of these crops, these uh, cohabitating crops had on the soil biology. Um, been an agronomist for a little bit in the Mission Valley, um, working with uh, organic and conventional farmers on soil fertility, as well as crop protection stuff. Um, and I'm here now in RCS, and I love it. And um, we also have a little farm in Moise, Montana. Um, it's a little banana belt with gravelly soils. Um, but we, we kind of warm up early. Um, and we kind of focus our efforts on garlic seed because that's, that's what we love. Um, so I, there's, I was reading this Joel Salatin book a while back, and he's awesome. And uh, I just wanted you guys to, to read this, and I'll read it to you. But it kind of is how I feel about soils and, and growing plants. Everything's below the ground. And a lot of times we just associate things in our way of thinking with what's above ground, what you see. So um, hopefully we can be mindful of what's below the soil and go from there. But yeah, in our Western Greco-Roman compartmentalized, fragmented, systemized, linear reductionist, individualistic, <laughs> disconnected, parts-oriented thinking, we tend to disassociate the seen from the unseen, and we do so at our own peril. We are all, every one of us, simply a manifestation of the invisible world. And so that's just something that's kind of my paradigm, and I'm just going to throw it out there to you guys. So today I wanted to go over uh, kind of the fundamentals of healthy soils, productive soils, and how to cultivate them. And we want to look at how to use cover crops to fit in uh, some of your management goals, because they can certainly help. And then we um, want to look at how to select a cover crop mix for your place. Um, and then we'll look at ways to seed them, uh, ways to terminate them, and then ancillary benefits of cover crops, like things maybe you didn't think or, um, they could provide, or maybe things that you didn't think that they might be hurting you in the future. So we'll look at some of those things. And then, um, because we're, I'm really active with our conservation district, in Lake County, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing there um, as far as our outreach and our, our trials, because I think there's value in them too. Uh, so what makes up a healthy soil? Um, and I want to ask you guys that to see um, see what your opinions are on that. I know you might have some opinion. Yeah, uh, basically the minerals that makes it, makes it healthy. Definitely. Uh, your um, pH. Um, pH, yeah. Organic material. Yep. And. Um, you can refer to the slide too. Yeah, really. Okay. Yeah, all that kind of is makes up a healthy soil. You want to have organic matter. So you want to have physical, chemical, and biological. And kind of soil health is kind of the middle part there. And when they all overlap, that's that's uh, that's a healthy soil. Um, one of my coworkers in Bozeman uh, created this slide on the right here, and um, it's a great visual of what a healthy soil looks like. Um, the one on the right's no-till, and it hasn't been disturbed. For 15 years, it's been a continual crop for 15 years, no-till, and it's conventional, um, conventional fertilizer. Um, and the one on the left is a wheat fallow, and in the fallow years, it's tilled a couple times to manage for weeds, so that ground's disturbed. You can definitely tell a difference in color right away. The no-till soil is darker, uh, has more organic matter associated with it. The one on the left's more pale. <laughs> the one on the right, I can see worm, a worm channel in the bottom right corner, so that tells me the biological components functioning pretty well there. The structure on the one to the right is more granular, it's more round, so it's going to be able to suck down water and then it's going to breathe, so it's going to be able to give microorganisms and the plant roots air in there. So 
That's just a good visual on what a healthy soul looks like. I need to drive home the point of what so, uh, soul health is. Um, I just wanted to give you a definition of it. Um, and I think it's the capacity for the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. And I want to emphasize the human part because I feel like if we have healthy soils, we can make humans more healthy too. Um, and the big part, takeaway message is that you're building so resilience in your soil. So when you prove the healthier soil, you're going to be able to resist pH changes, shifts in water, maybe um, with a changing climate, you're, um, and perhaps we have less water in the future, or maybe it comes in different times of the year, so you can absorb what's given to you and hold on to it longer. And the same is true with nutrients. So um, you're also, yeah, I'll just stop there. And this little diagram is a nice little example of the components that make up a healthy soil. And um, I like lists, and uh, I'm a big fan of lists. <laughs> so um, the, the big keys to soil health um, are to keep it covered, to minimize your disturbances, to try to have a diverse, uh, diversity of plants growing throughout the year, throughout the season, throughout the lifetime of that soil, um, and to try to incorporate animals whenever possible. I think that's one that's often overlooked, uh, but animals have a huge um, component that they can bring to making your soil healthy. Um, this is just a good example of like uh, soil with some organic matter on the surface. That happens to be a pea. Um, this is Jay Fuhrer, who's a guru of soil health in North Dakota. Uh, and he's got a shovel full of delicious, smelly, earthworm filled soil. Um, this is an organic farm I get to work with in St. Ignatius. And they have a cover crop in their high tunnel, so they're trying to. Um, keep a living root there after they harvest in the spring, in the fall and the spring. And then some ideas for incorporating animals into the equation are chickens and cattle, which most people have. So the big thing with uh, making your soil as healthy is you're building resilience. But you also resist um, pathogens, so you resist um, outbreaks of fungal diseases or bacterial diseases when you start to have diversity of crops growing and when you start to have healthier soils. Uh, nutrient availability is going to, soil is going to hang on to nutrients, it's going to hang on to water as well, um, and you're going to have less weed competition, less runoff. That's my selling slide right there, just kind of, just to sell you. And that's my favorite soil from Bozeman, it's a mollusol. Um, just, I mean, that's a healthy soil, it's in a perennial system. Um, they probably built houses on it by now, but anyway. <laughs> um, there are a lot of tools that you can use to make your soils healthy too, and uh, I can pitch all these things to you. Um, there's compost, there's mulch, there's manure, there's perennial plants, there's humus, cover crops, diversity of species, compost tea, inoculant stimulants. But um, I think the coolest thing is cover crops. Like they can help touch on all those keys to soil health. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. So um, there's compost tea, there's some mulch on some fruit trees. Uh, there's some verma compost. This is a farmer that had some perennial vegetation in between their, their, their outside crops. So there's a variety of things that can make your soil healthy. But don't forget your keys. Uh, don't leave home without them. Uh, I just want to hone in on that. So you can do all those things, but just remember your keys. And if you touch on those keys, um, you're going to start building your soil and improving the health of it. So let's look at cover crops. Um, a cover crop is a, typically a plant that's planted to address a resource concern. They can be perennial, they can be annual, but typically they're annuals and they're easier to manage than just letting it go uh, to weeds or um, yeah, I'll just stop on that. Um, in the slides, uh, these are like poster children of cover mm -hmm. crops. This is a turnip and a radish, a daikon radish. Mm -hmm. And these, this was um, in the south part of our valley. This is a coworker um, showing those with a big smile on her face. And then Phacelia, that's a, um, another annual flower that's really hardy. It attracts bees. It flowers for a long time. It's super easy to manage. What's um, it called? It's called Phacelia. That's P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A. It's a native annual, and I think it's native to California, but it's in the Tansy family. Mm -hmm. um, it flowers from April. I've, I've had it flower from April into October uh, in my house. So um, anyway, that's kind of what that looks like. Um, there's what a multi-species looks like. Um, so you have broadleaves, you have grasses, you have legumes, and it's all over uh, kind of an organic mulch um, layer on the soil. So it's going to take up sunlight, it's going to stop rain from directly hitting the soil, so you have a multi-layered canopy. And that's, that's kind of what you can get with, with cover crops. And then the bottom photo is a um, renovation using cover crops. So they're also excellent forage crops for your animals. So this 
this farm um, is high, high stock density grazing off their cover crops. And this is in Moise. This is the south part of our valley. This is just six miles from where I live. So it's kind of a cool area. Um, anyway, so with cover crops, you need to kind of have a set of goals that you want to attain. Like you want to um, kind of maybe even write them down and then select your cover crop to hone in on those goals. So I uh, have a bunch of goals here that I want to just walk you through. So you can armor your soil, you can keep it covered in times when you don't have a plant growing. You can add organic matter, carbon inputs. Um, you can keep a living root in the ground with cover crops, provide diversity to help resist and improve um, resilience to pathogens. Uh, they're great at cycling nutrients, especially from deep down, like some of those root systems like oats can go really deep, the three feet deep, and then uh, hold on to some of those nutrients, put them in their leaves, and then when you terminate them, you bring those minerals from deep down in the soil to the surface. So it's cycling of nutrients that way. Um, Say oats. Oats are, yeah, oats are one I like for scavenging nutrients. Buckwheat's another great one for phosphorus scavenging. And then um, it flower, it, yeah, I could talk to you all day about buckwheat. <laughs> um, sorry, when I get okay. excited, I uh, start talking really quick. So I just realized I need to throttle back just a little bit. Um, other things cover crops can do is improve your mycorrhizal fungi. Um, um, also, they can hurt them too, just uh, as an FYI. Um, you can improve your bacteria populations. You can support wildlife. You can mitigate compaction, like with that daikon radish that um, that's uh, the poster child of reducing compaction because it has that big arm of a tuber that gets in the ground and busts up hard pans. Um, also, you can attract beneficial insects, and that's always a goal of mine is to, to draw in native pollinators and to draw in parasitic wasps to help do some of the um, pest management for me. Um, and then also, to, yeah, to mitigate compaction in season. So a lot of times I'll put cover crops in the rows between um, hardy cover crops, like like oats in between uh, vegetables just so I have the ground covered and it um, when I walk on it all summer long it gets compacted so it helps reduce the compaction too. Mm -hmm. So the big thing to take home is that it, you can build your soil health. It's not a silver bullet but it certainly can is a great tool to build soil health. I have a question. Sure. So if you're growing those daikon radishes in between your harvesting vegetables and you're walking on those tops all the time, doesn't that stop? Oh yeah, that's a good growing? question. So um, growing daikon radishes in between your vegetable rows, I wouldn't do that one necessarily, but like something like a grass, like a winter wheat or an oat, um, that would be the one I would choose for that. Daikon radishes, yeah, because they have such a big, the Top. root comes out of the ground, you know, it would be troublesome to walk on and unpleasant. So yeah, um, I didn't mean to say that that would be a good one to use, definitely not. Turnips too. Turnips you can twist an ankle on if you're not careful. <laughs> um, um, but then to uh, to hone in on that too, a lot of times these uh, cover crops you can also harvest them for food, so they have a, a double purpose too. So they're building soil health and they're also edible. Um, I always like to. So where do you grow like those radishes in between cabbages? I usually like to use radi um, the daikon radishes um, after. Uh, an area I did some tillage in the previous year, like, like so like I'll harvest my potatoes um, and I usually kind of till up that ground because it likes to be aerated and then uh, after I harvest them I'll put in something that's cold hardy so radishes are a good fit for that and they kind of get deep down and they they break down over the winter so they just provide a good channel for, um, for air and water to get deep down. So they don't, mine don't get that big by the way that's a you're not actually harvesting the radishes, you just leave them in the ground to do their thing. I do, but you could harvest, you could certainly eat the radish too, uh, once it matures. Yep. In the turnip, um, there's peas that are also delicious and, and you can use them as a cover crop, but um, typically cover crop seed is inexpensive because they're not the most delicious varieties of di like daikon, they're really spicy. Um, and I'm not a big fan of turnips, like there's some turnips I like but you have to really put some butter on them. <laughs> so those I'll leave out there. Um, but that is a good question though. Um, yeah. Seriously, a deer attractant? I know. Deer? <laughs> like we would be column. looking for something to keep them out. Yeah, I know. I know, so and this is... Uh, so you don't put that. Yes, out. these we would not That's, put Yep, out. right. So this slide definitely shows you the benefits. Like the goals are at the top of this thing. And then um, the species of cover crops that are really good to use are, are below. And some work really well. 
and some don't really. The next slide here um, is one that um, we developed in Lake County, specifically with our growers that work really well, and I, I think they would work pretty well here for you guys. Um, so there's cool season grasses, cool season broadleaves, and those are typically planted um, like into May. And once it turns hot, um, warm season legumes, warm season grasses, and warm season broadleaves are what you would want to use. The warm season plants tend to get a lot of biomass, um, but they're kind of slow to germinate if you don't have a soil temperature that's like above 50. So um, I usually like to hedge my bets with cool season, with a cool season heavy mix, and then add some a few warm season things in there to kind of um, come on later in the year. So you'd make a seed mix. I like mixes a lot. Okay. Yeah. And I, um, but you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, a lot of times, if you just want to cover an area, you have some leftover oat seed, or like a, um, maybe it's a good deal at the at the um, seed store. Oats are, are some sort of grain is a good seed, seed variety to um, compete with grasses and other broadleaf weeds because they germinate so quickly. So you could have a monoculture of that if you wanted to. If that was your goal, is to just um, cover the ground, that would be a good one. Grains. But I like, I like multi-species mix because I like diversity. I think it's, if you're going to do it, um, just add a few extra things in there. So um, Gabe Brown in North Dakota puts it, you want to design your mix for what you don't have. And I like that a lot. So, so I, um, you have to look at where your goals are. And so I'm going to be vulnerable and tell, I'm going to make a mix based off my place. And so I have a lot of, I have weed problems. Um, yeah. I was going to ask you a quick uh, saw Sudan, Sudan grass. Sudan grass, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that plant? Okay, um, you're asking about Sudan grass and some of its properties. Yes. Well, it's a it's a warm season grass, and it's kind of like a corn that's been bred to not have an ear with it. Um, and it's a it's a good grass to graze. In addition to other things, it puts on a lot of biomass. It grows really quickly. Uh, it has a really deep taproot system, um, but also has if it's in a stand by itself it tends to have high prussic acid so if you're going to graze it um, it's a good thing to to not have it all by itself and especially not to graze it right after a frost because those those things tend to increase the prussic acid in it so um, I, I certainly can tell you more about yeah, sudan grass and there's a lot of varieties of sudan grass and there's hybrids um, out there bmr grazing uh, one is, is a hybrid one that has a huge leaf on it it's like and it gets super tall so um, I like forage species because they have a lot uh, big leaf and I'm trying to build carbon so I want a huge leaf I want to block um, moisture from having direct contact with the soil so those are that's what I tend to go toward are the forage brands but, um, so again going back to being vulnerable uh, I want to go over a mix that um, I, I'm gonna put in pretty soon as soon as the snow melts at our place um, and I want to build some organic matter I want to have a diversity of plants out there because um, I I'm always looking to um, kind of have a diversity of things under the soil. So to not just have uh, a lot of bacteria or a lot of fungi, I want to have something that's going to feed both of those things. I want to suppress weeds. Um, in Lake County, we have a blessing of a lot of different weeds that are just prolific everywhere. So I'm always trying to, to um, get the jump on annual weeds. And then I also want to provide pollinator habitat. And uh, providing pollinator habitat is something I do every year. And uh, I add certain species every year to do that. Um, so let's see here. I also want to plant it in late spring, so probably like mid-May-ish, somewhere in there. Um, for, and I want to have all year growth. I want to broadcast a seed. So I'm going to look at that in the equation, and it's irrigated. Um, I'm going to, and that's a big thing, it's a big factor. Um, most of these mixes are for irrigated gardens. Um, you can do them in dry land. They're a lot less successful, um, and you're a little bit more limited on what species you can use for dry land seed. So. All right, so um, this is kind of like the book I've learned the most from about cover crops. It's Managing Cover Crops Profitably. It's a free book that Sayre put out, and that's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. They're out of California. But this is free, and it's online, and it's an incredible resource uh, that's been compiled. And this chart that's on this slide is directly from that book. So on the top, it has your goals, your resource concerns, um, nitrogen scavenging, soil building, erosion fighting, weed fighting, good for grazing, quick growth. And then down on this column here, it has different types of cover crops and then it kind of gives you a good graphic. Um, so like white clover would be really good at grazing because it's high in crude protein. Um, but it might not be the best 
at scavenging for nitrogen because it's a legume it's going to fix its own nitrogen so it's not going to be scavenging for extra nitrogen so okay going back to our goals at our place um, I want something with quick growth I want something that's going to fight erosion uh, build soil carbon so I'm kind of using that along with this there's some more um, pages in the book that hone in on the other goals um, and this is just an awesome resource to kind of cover the gamut of goals and it shows a good graphic on how to uh, make a selection so um, this is kind of what I've used um, to start like selecting certain varieties for cover crops um, and then over time I just kind of know um, after doing it for a while uh, what works so I just want to give you guys this tool because I think it's awesome to give you a good solid foundation and then from there you can kind of build your own and play and get creative. Yeah. Do you have a favorite resource for the small gardener? A favorite resource? Yeah, I think um, keeping the ground covered is a... Uh, um, I mean as far as where you would buy your seed. Oh, a great resource, sorry. Um, do, you, are you, or do you prefer an organic seed or does it matter to you? Okay, sometimes you're limited on seed sources if you're an organic farmer. Um, we've like, we have a seed store, Westland Seed, that's in Ronan. We keep hounding them to buy organic seed and to get these funky varieties. And so they've got a few varieties that are organic, but um, by and large, if you want that, you have to go probably online to get it. Um, or you can ask uh, like your local Cinex or something like that to order them special, um, and you can do that. Um, David, have you, you guys bought any cover crop seeds locally, or do you have any sources you found? Yeah. Yep, so yeah, we're kind of limited, but um, like um, Johnny's is a great source for seeds, and all the seed catalogs nowadays have a section just on cover crops. Mm -hmm. They might not have the variety like that, um, that this book has, but um, they're kind of doing more mainstream uh, mixes, which is which I is good. Fedco out of Maine, yeah, like Fedco, definitely. Yep, yeah, they're awesome. And then there's a uh, for large scale farming. There's a there's a company called uh, Green Cover Seed. Let's see here it's just right here they have a um, cover crop calculator so what it does is you put in your resource concerns and then it gives you a box of a different a bunch of different plants that work for your specific area code so I, I'll use this sometimes too um, if someone lives in a different part of the country that I'm familiar with because they're this is really good at um, making a concise uh, giving you options for your specific area code it goes off the of zones and it asks you questions about what your goals are, uh, what time of year you're going to plant it, and then how you're going to plant it too. It, it'll give you a rate as well. So I wanted to show that to you guys as well. But um, they're a good company. They're out of uh, Nebraska, and they typically sell like bulk bags of seed to people, like thousands of pounds at the same time. Uh, but I think they do small mixes as well. Um, you could buy, a, you could get together with your neighbor and get a bunch of stuff from them all at once if you wanted to. Um, but so then, this is the mix I selected. I just wanted to kind of show you a visual of it. Um, so I was going to pick an oat in there. I like to have a grass species, and then that's one that's going to be the backbone of the mix. Um, it's going to be the most vigorous. It's going to um, germinate quickly, and it's going to kind of hone in on some of those goals. Um, forage collards is one I've just fallen in love with recently. Um, being from the south, I love collards, but this one has been bred um, to have a big, big fat leaf, so it's really tasty. Um, and it grows quickly in the springtime, so it's, I get a lot of quick germination, and so it's com competitive. I and mean, that big leaf really helps um, uh, compete with some of the chickweed that I have at our place, and I can't seem to get rid of chickweed. Um, and then Phacelia is the other one that I just absolutely love. It comes on early and it flowers for a long time. It's an annual, it's easy to manage, and if it does go to seed, it's not the end of the world. Uh, hairy vetch is a annual vetch that fixes a lot of nitrogen. So that's going to help with improving the soil right there. Let me back up too and say that the oats and a lot of the grasses um, have a lot of carbon in the stem. So they're going to improve your organic matter levels just by having a high carbon uh, constitute. So that's going to hone in on that goal. Um, moving on, uh, chickpeas is another legume that's a warm season legume. So that might uh, come on later in the year when I want to have another um, plant coming on in the warmer time of the year to fix nitrogen. I always put sunflowers in my mixes because they're really cheap and they have a different, um, the canopy on them is different. They get really tall statured, um, so they can in, like, intercept moisture and they also attract birds that eat bugs that, that um, 
you know, eat my plants in the garden. So that is attracting a beneficial in that regard. And they also have a really cool root system. They have like a, a root system, as you guys have probably seen, they splinter out, they have a tap root. Um, it's really um, awesome for fungi in the soil. Um, sunflowers tend to really attract fungi. Uh, and then sorghum Sudan grass is the other one I chose, just to have a late season grass come on. Um, and then I have a spreadsheet I use to kind of help me and break down how much to plant. And so I put like 50% oats, 10% of the rest, just because um, the seed size of all those other crops are really small. So um, I just added 10% to each of those. So then this mix comes through and it tells me that I have about 56 pounds per acre. So I can do the math and know I'm doing a half acre of cover crops. Maybe I wanna double that rate because I'm gonna broadcast it to hedge my bets on being successful. Uh, that rates just for like a, if you had a, a drill, you're going to plant it that way. Um, I know it's hard to see back there, but um, it's a spreadsheet. I'd be more than happy to share this spreadsheet with you. This is an NRCS spreadsheet that we use as a job sheet, and you can auto-populate these cells here. So um, right away it tells you, it fills in the rest of the stuff that's in white, so it tells you the seed, per, seed count, like the seeds per pound, and so it does all the math for you. Um, you can also find it online. If you just type in NRCS uh, cover crop job sheet. Yeah. So that's how I select a mix right there. And then it tells me how much to plant. Um, it's, it's kind of an art too, um, figuring out um, the different seed sizes and how much to put down. Um, and then it's after you do it a few times, you kind of hone in on what to use, what not to use. And then talking to others, um, uh, the organic folks that I get to work with are such a good resource to ask, like, oh, how did that buckwheat do for you? this year. Um, have you guys ever planted Ladino white clover before? Um, you know, just kind of nerd out. Or if you, um, if you want to go old school, you can always give us a call in Ronan. Um, we're happy to talk cover crops with you. And we, we, um, we love it. It makes our, like, it just gives us a little revive every day when we talk to someone who wants to plant cover crops. So um, that's my uh, contact information. And then my supervisor, Ben, is equally as nerdy with cover crops as me. Um, either between the two of us, we can talk your ear off all day. So, um, all right, do you guys have any questions on how to make a mix from that? I know I kind of just blew through it, but. And when you said broadcast, are you just. There's different ways. I'll, I'll um, when I say broadcast, I mean, um, I've got a spreader that I put, it has a, a little container that holds seeds and has a um, handle that kind of. And do you strap it to yourself? That, that's the kind I have. I'll show you those in a moment. I've got some different types of uh, ways to see oh, okay. later. Yep, that's a good question though. So um, another way that I found that I use cover crops is adding diversity out there. So um, with uh, high intensity vegetable production, sometimes your rotations are tight. You have a, you only have um, you know maybe 100 by 20 area. So you might have to grow potatoes. Like like you may not be able to have five years before potatoes go back in that spot, maybe three years. So um, using cover crops, you can get quick growth and kind of break those season long uh, rotations into, into blocks. So maybe you might have an early season uh, cover crop, then your um, like greens or something like that. And then once you harvest those, put it, put it back into a cover crop so you can get three species in that year. Um, and so you can help break disease cycles that way as well with cover crops. So you're increasing the diversity below ground um, in between crop harvests. Um, and then recently we had a talk, we had a big workshop in, uh, in Missoula and one of uh, my gurus, uh, Fred Provenza, he's a plant animal uh, interaction specialist and he's retired from the U University of Utah. Uh, his big thing that I learned from him is that nature abhors uniformity. Um, and I'm not really sure what abhors mean, but I don't think abhors is like a, a word I want to I, I uh, fear it, so I, was gonna say, I don't want to be abhorred, so I want diversity out there. And so in talking with him over that, like plants interact with particular microbes. Um, plants exude a specific sugar, and a specific microbe really likes that. So um, if you have all the grass, you're going to select for a microbe that really is good at, at having a relationship with that grass specific. So. Um, if you have broadleaf plants out there, you're going to attract a different type of micro because it extracts or it exudes a, a different uh, substance, a different sugar off its roots. So um, that's the other thing with promoting diversity in your garden. Um, 
And if you guys haven't heard of Fred Provenza, you should look him up. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. He's retired. He lives in Dillon now, um, and he was such a kick in the pants to learn from uh, at our uh, Western Montana Grazing Conference this year. So um, I want to give you an example of how you can use um, a diversity of cover crops in your cropping system. So I work with a, um, like a four-acre vegetable production farm, Foothill Farm in St. Ignatius. And they, in 2012, had one high tunnel they were growing tomatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. Um, and you can guess, like, What's, what I'm about to say, like they were starting to have issues with fungal diseases, and they were starting to become more prevalent. So what they did is they got another high tunnel um, to help add the flexibility, but they also um, started incorporating a crop rotation. So they had greens, that they, that's one of their marketable crops that they have. So they would do cover crop, they would do greens after the cover crop, and then greens again in the fall. And then in the springtime, they would try to get um, water up the cover crop from last fall and then terminate that and plant their tomatoes in that. So they have four different plants in between tomatoes. So they went from a one-year rotation to a four-year rotation just in having a different high tunnel and adding some cover crops into that rotation. And that's something I feel that um, is one of the, the best um, parts of having cover crops in your, in your rotation because it can certainly help hone in on that specific goal of having a rotation. So they eventually got a mobile high tunnel that has three positions to remove. So now like the rotations are endless, what they can do. And it's kind of cool. I'm excited to see uh, how that works out for them. And then this picture here, um, it's, a, it's a cover crop in between greens. That's buckwheat, just a pure sand of buckwheat uh, because it grows so quickly. Uh, it pulls up nitrogen, or it pulls up phosphorus from down low and um, they can bring in beneficial insects to, uh, with its flower. Yeah, it's also a little bit stinky, buckwheat is. It has an odor, but um, it's, it's an awesome plant. Um, and then this slide, I just wanted to show you guys, highlight the diversity of things that are below ground to go back to that initial quote from Joel Salatin. All these little critters live in the soil, and it's important to take care of them because um, if you take care of them and get things in balance down there, then your plants are going to be healthy, and then they're going to provide you with more healthy food. There's also some unintended consequences of cover crops, like they're not all good. Um, sometimes plants uh, exude things in their roots that are allelopathic. They, um, that means that it inhibits the germination of another plant. Um, alfalfa is an example of that. Um, alfalfa, if you try to plant in a stand of alfalfa, alfalfa, um, it won't grow. It just, um, there's something that exudes so it doesn't overpopulate itself. So that's kind of a classic example of that. Napweed is another example that ha is, exudes uh, chemicals in its, from its roots that hinders the germination of other grasses. So um, this chart is something I found from, uh, this is from the Burley County uh, Extension Agency. Um, I know that's in North Dakota and that's kind of in cahoots with Gabe Brown, but they're really progressive and they, they had developed this chart on just being mindful of uh, what not to follow. So a good example, if you're gonna do barley, don't plant barley again because, I mean, that's what we do. We have in our big fields wheat on wheat, but it's not the best idea because um, you're going to start to proliferate these soil-borne diseases when you start having the same crop follow it. But then um, canola also has an effect on um, a positive effect and a negative effect on certain plants. So it's just important to be mindful of that. Um, I'll let you guys look at that. I'm not going to go through any more specific examples, but um, yeah, just be aware. And then there's also ancillary benefits of cover crops. Uh, and this is uh, another thing I really love. Um, you can attract parasitic wasps, you can attract um, pollinators to your place if you have something flowering, uh, and they're gonna work for you. Like this is a slide from some friend's farm in South Dakota, and these are all like lace wings, ladybugs, native bees, parasitic wasps, butterflies, and they're all in their deal. Oh, and here's a spider. So they're all working for you. They're eating bugs that are um, maybe aphids that are attacking your lettuce. Um, and they're hungry for it. They work hard for you if you let them, if you provide them habitat. So um, on the left here is kind of some garlic at our place. Um, and I put some phacelia beside it because I like to attract um, beneficial insects to uh, some of my cash crops. Um, and I overseeded it. I ended up having to thin it out. But so don't look too hard at that. Um, and then that's what phacelia looks like too. That was from that crop. Um, and you can see some garlic leaf beside it. Um, it's hard to kill it to me because I, I love that plant so much. <laughs> like I'm willing to let it take a little yield bump because it does have such a pretty flower and it attracts so many beneficial bugs. 
So mm -hmm. anyway, so there's some ancillary benefits. I'm sure you guys can think of others um, benefits from cover crops too, like just having um, a variety of plants out there attracting things and, and working for you. Um, so with seeding cover crops, there's a variety of ways you can do it. If you're large scale, you can use a, a drill, and a no-till drill would be the best because it disturbs the soil the least. Um, but uh, the one on the left here is kind of a hoe drill, walk behind drill, and it meters seed out and puts it uniformly into the soil. That's gonna be really good because you get great seed soil contact. You're gonna have a high germination rate with something like that. Um, you can also use a spreader, either of those two, um, like a walk behind spreader like you'd use for grass seed or fertilizer. Um, I would just encourage you to try to rake behind it or do something to encourage seed soil contact. That'll uh, increase your likelihood for success. The, the one on the right is the one I have. Um, you just load it up and then spin it out and it puts it out uniformly. Um, and then um, I've been here before and I do this a lot too. Sometimes you just have a small area. To do it by hand is great. Um, there's advantages of that. But you oftentimes put out more seed than you, uh, than you would if you were to meter it out with a spreader. So just be mindful of that. And then again, with this one, you'd want to hope, like um, rake it or roll it or something to make seed soil contact. And then uh, let's not forget about how to manage that cover crop once you get it in and get it growing. Uh, you could use tillage to terminate your crop, um, but then just be aware too, sometimes all the benefits your cover crops provide. If you turn the rototiller on and start shredding it up, you're gonna, you're gonna shred up your mycorrhizal fungi, you're gonna uh, maybe cut some of your earthworms up. Um, doing it mindfully is, the way I would suggest. That's light tillage on the surface, just breaking that root system up and then putting it back on the surface. Mowing it's my favorite way. You clip it and then put it back on the ground surface and then it kills the plant or uh, stops it from growing uh, that way as well. Um, using litter just to freeze out and kill um, plants um, naturally is another way, but you often uh, can have things reseed. So if you don't want to reseed, it may not be the best idea to use freezing. You can weed whack, you can graze it down, which is a great way as well, because there are a lot of benefits to chickens, to cows, to pigs, um, horses. Uh, you can spray it with whatever you want to, vinegar, Roundup, whatever. I'm not gonna judge you for that, it's your place. Uh, you can flame it if you want, that's another good one. Solarization's another one we're finding it works okay. It just takes a lot longer, um, and that's just putting plastic on the surface that heats the ground up, like clear plastic and it um, just um, heats it up, kills the plant. It also uh, makes the soil temperature like 110 degrees, so you might be killing some of your beneficial bacteria and fungi there too. And you can solarize it, you can pulverize it. It's your soil, you can do what you want with it. But um, do you guys have any um, questions at this point on that? Okay. So I also want to talk to you guys about what we're doing in Lake County with using cover crops for forage. So that's where I feel like they shine. Um, and this is an example. Uh, there was a spent hay field that was uh, alfalfa that had kind of played out and became um, a lot of annual and perennial weeds. Um, there's a lot of quack grass, which isn't very palatable. It, it takes over. There's a lot of cheat grass that was in this particular stand. And then uh, some thistle in there as well. So the MO in our county is that uh, people will use tillage to take an alfalfa field out of production. And then they put in a, like a forage hay like peas, oats, and barley is one that comes to mind. And they cut that for hay for a couple of years. And so that kind of manages the weeds over two years and then they plant it back to alfalfa. Um, and that has, that's, that's okay. But I think we can do things better. We can disturb the soil less. So we've um, started working with Faust down in Moise and, uh, and just looking at the potential improvements you can do with a no-till drill and using cover crops to just graze off. Uh, that way you're not, you don't have the cost of haying so we're moving that you don't have to pay for the gas, for the combine, or for the, the, the baler, the swather, and then to stack it. So you're reducing your passes in the field that way. And there are some great benefits. So here's an example of a cool season mix. It works really well in Lake County. And you don't have to do all these species, but these species are tried and true. They work really well. I just wanted to show you, like you can have a diverse mix, or you can hone that down to two or three things, or even one thing, um, just depending on what your goals are. Um, here is a warm season mix, so that's kind of what that looks like. Um, and it has some cool season broadleafs in it as well, um, because they will turn up the juice and 
in the fall when it gets cold, they'll start growing a lot more. So we try to cover the range of growing season uh, in the latter part of the year with that mix. Let's see here. Oh yeah, I'm out of time. Kind of that's all I had to talk to you guys about. Um, if you guys have any specific questions or have any um, specific ideas for a mix or some resource concerns you want to address, I'd be happy to go over it. Yeah. So when you're, um, so it's grown for a while, are you then cutting it off and like doing a chop and drop method? Yep, and I use it moment. Services mulch? Yep, definitely. So it keeps it covered. Um, I usually do that before it goes to seed. Um, okay. I don't mind things going to seed so much, but um, it depends on what the following crop is. If it's gonna so if I'm using this in my vegetable garden, mm -hmm. like say around peppers, where I'm just planting it in with the peppers, mm -hmm. then I'm just cutting cutting it down when it gets so tall. Yeah, you you wouldn't want to get it too close to the peppers, but like a low growing plant, like a white clover, might be a okay. good fit. Um, it fixes nitrogen, covers the soil, it spreads out, um, and you can walk on it. You can kind of I mean, be tough on it. Um, if you were to put something like oats really close to that, they might get too competitive. You might be weeding those out. But if you put it in the rows around it, um, okay. like white clover and oats. Putting it in the walkway? Mm -hmm. Yep, surrounding the plant like or where you're walking. Um, okay. That could be a good fit for that scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you can mow it if you feel like it's getting too out of hand. If you, uh, everyone gardens so differently. Like uh, their threshold for their comfort threshold is different. And I, I kind of get a little bit laid back. I don't mind seeing things get really tall. I love seeing um, plants take off. But then um, some there's certain grains like like annual rye. If it starts to seed out, like it can be a, it can be a hard one. Um, so I'll mow it uh, and then put that on the ground. And then I've actually seen I've got a good video of an earthworm bringing a leaf. Like just coming out of the ground, grabbing the leaf and then pulling it back in the ground. So I like to, to feed those guys too. So and then I like to look at them. Um, you know, I get pretty bored. <laughs> and that's what I love to do. Um, so I, when I see that, I'm just like, you know, out in the field, jumping noise. for joy. It is slow. <laughs> we don't have internet or. or, or <laughs> we got worms. We have worms. I'm sure. Yeah. It's like that. Yeah. Ground squirrels. No ground squirrels. No. Oh my god, you're so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You said that you don't want uh, natural water to get on the ground. You um, said you wanted to put, run down the broad leaf. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. The question was why don't you want water to hit the ground directly? And so, uh, like, direct contact with a raindrop to the soil has an impact on it, and it, it, there's a potential for erosion. And there's a. Um, I just like it to be intercepted and then be delivered to the ground softly. <laughs> Um, and so if you can intercept things and then if the plants get it right away and it kind of goes down their, their stem, it's going to get into the soil quicker um, and rather than if it hits the ground. There's a little splatter. Um, it, it's kind of disrupting the soil structure. I just I feel like if you can armor the soil, um, the more you can armor it, the better you're going to be as far as erosion and wind erosion, so, uh, water erosion, that, that sort of thing. But if you have a cover crop of all broadly, and when the water hits the broadly, it runs down the stem, runs down into the soil. You don't have as much coverage in the soil. That's true, yep. Okay, I just wonder if my thinking is yeah, yeah. warped or what. No, no, I, you're right. And it's just my, probably my way of visually thinking about that scenario. Um, it's just different, yeah. And I like broad leaves because uh, they're, when, once they get going, they really cover the soil and inhibit other things from germinating. Like, um, we also have cheatgrass that's <laughs> in our area. It came in with some hay. Um, and so if I get a broadleaf out there, I know it's going to stop that from germinating. And that's, um, it's so hard to pull cheatgrass because it's like pulling hair. And then you still have a root in the ground. So that's, um, I'm just speaking from my experience on the broadleaf thing. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it's important to soil test too, just to see the effects of building organic matter, to know that how well you're doing. Um, yeah, I, I, um, couldn't say do that more enough. Um, it's a great tool too to kind of gauge where you're at and to give you some, some knowledge. Yeah. Who does soil testing? Um, soil testing, um, I was just talking to this gentleman, um, Spectrum uh, Analytica. Analytica, and they're out of um, Ohio. Ohio. That's a good one. But you have to send off, no matter where, um, Montana, have a place Montana right? State does not, uh, the, the university system doesn't do that anymore for free. Uh, but you can send it to, um, and it's, 
it's like a coffee bag sample you can send and get it sampled for like um, I know Midwest Labs does it. Their, their cheap one is 12 bucks. It just gives you N, P, and K in organic matter. But you can do um, an extensive soil test that looks at the soil biology as well. It costs 50 bucks a sample. And they're gonna tell you the amount of bacteria, fungi in the soil, your seed-in ratio, organic matter level, and it, it presents it on a really pretty graph. And that's the what you said, Ohio? Um, Spectrum Analytica does that out of Ohio. Yeah, they, they do that out of Ohio. <coughs> Graphs that then tells you how much you recommend awesome. to put into the soil so you yeah. can break it down mm -hmm. by papers and It's going to be a little careful on a few things because how they're fixed, how they determine it there is a little different from some of our stuff out in this soil. So there's a couple of things that came up super high on the test mm -hmm. and we called them to see what the deal was there because the way they test it there is different because our soil was much more neutral or than, than acidic right. and whatever where they're putting on that lime and we were more likely to be putting on sulfur or something out here it, it was off so he said you have to have a different kind of test done and you have to specify that beforehand yep. if you're going to do it and that's probably the um for phosphorus there's phosphorus olsen and there's bray testing and so in montana we do olsen p testing um olsen yep and so we have um calcium dominated soils for the most part and so that that helps account for that there's also different tests that you can order through that company. You can say, I want this, this, and this, and we will do that test for you. Are they all different? Yeah. Every single bird. That's definitely it. Okay, forget that. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing. There's such a variety of mm -hmm. a lot vegetables that have been in the earth already that every area is going to be out yeah, well, that's the thing. Every single I, bed is it may not be cost, it may be cost prohibitive fixed with on that, and that's new. But if you're growing vegetables for production, I mean, it's certainly well, yeah. a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. How about for, uh, for our water use and so forth? You've got all these things in there, gonna, whatever irrigation water you're putting in there, are taking that much of it, you're just doing that much more application in order to get the necessary water to your corn, peas, potatoes, whatever else you got there? Yep, yeah, the cover crops are definitely going to use water, um, and they're, uh, they're going to do better with irrigation, um, but they're also going to, um, once you start putting them down, like the mulch is going to hold the moisture beneath the soil, so it's not exposed to radiation or like solar radiation, so it's going to, yeah, there's definitely a cost benefit with doing cover crops too. Um, it will cost a little money to irrigate them if you use your well or if you're paying for irrigation water. Yeah. What was the $12 test? Was that Midland? Oh, uh, it's the $12 soil test is Midwest Labs. Midwest, yep. And um, they're out of the Midwest somewhere. I think it's Ohio. <laughs> um, Stuken Holtz is one in Idaho. It's really close. Um, and we use them a lot. They have a, um, you can do a complete test and then you can do like an NPK test. And a lot of times they're like 20 bucks or something like that. Um, in that, that range for just a basic test that tests organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Um, and so the more things you add, the more expensive it becomes because of the more tests that are involved. And if you ever need help with deciphering what the soil test um, is telling you, you can always get in touch with me. Um, I, I love doing that. That's one thing um, um, I'm pretty good at is, is um, helping people with nutrient management. Mm -hmm. So you just tell me what kind of crop you're gonna put in and I can tell you maybe how much compost to put down, or how, if you're going to use urea fertilizer, I can tell you maybe how much urea to put down to, to get your nitrogen, that sort of thing. Yeah. So if I'm going to plant corn in the same place, because I there's a huge greenhouse, yeah. and the woman has planted corn <clears throat> inside there, Okay. Um, and obviously it has to be in the same place because it's tall, Yeah. And what is there anything I can do to the soil to make a good um, early season, because corn's a warm season grass, it's going to be planted um, like, um, is it mid-May or early May when you start planting there? Or is it June? Okay. Well, in the greenhouse, I can do it. And I, if I start it with seeds, I can probably start plant in June with mm -hmm. seeds that are... Okay. Yeah, you can do a cover crop, a cool season cover crop before it, and then mow it down. Okay. And then that mulch will be on the ground to cover the soil, and then you'll have the nutrients from the leaves and that sort of thing um, right there on the ground surface, and you can direct plant into them. And then after you harvest it too, you can um, put a, like a cool season, okay. a, a different mix maybe right afterwards. That's where um, that tomato example 
that one would carry that would ring true for the corn example too okay the corn's like it's kind of a tough critter like it, it can take the implanted year after year in the same spot there's some bacterial diseases that hurt it a little bit but it's pretty tough like it's one that um, it's not the worst to grow year after year in the same okay. spot I hate to say but okay. um, and you can also do things like put um, vetch or some sort of um, clover underneath it once it gets going um, to intercede with it to keep the ground covered there so you have a different canopy like it won't grow uh, enough to be competitive with the corn but it'll just be like growing there and once you harvest once the corn starts to die back sunlight will penetrate those like uh, red clover or vetch and then once the corn dies off you'll have the cover crop pick up once because uh, you know, it's, that's a good thing that I do um, and we've seen um, with grazers who who have corn as well in our neck of the woods. So I could almost get in there like really soon and just put a cover crop in there and let it go and when I'm ready to plant just... Definitely. A cool season mixture would be what you would want to use. Right, because it gets yeah. really hot in there. And so like barley, oats, winter wheat, cereal, rye, kale, radishes, turnips, um, canola, phacelia again, peas, vetches, those are all going to those okay. would do well at that soil temperature. And that's another thing too, soil temperature um, plays a big role in germinating seeds. So if you put a warm season crop in, it'll just sit there like corn if you plant too early. And then you have issues with um, germination rates because it kind of gets moldy. And then, so um, I always check, <laughs> I got a little soil temperature mm -hmm. gauge and just check it. And then I know it's like, okay, it's 45 degrees. I can do it. I can put it right now. But um, when I don't do that, I have problems, especially with like carrots and beets and that sort of thing. I take a lot of germinate. Then weeds start growing around them. So. That's another tool I found that's really useful as a thermometer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any, is there any like potatoes you shouldn't plant in the same place every year? And is there other vegetable crops that you should not plant in the same place? Are there other vegetable crops Crop. you shouldn't grow year after year? I think from the same family. So like potatoes and tomatoes are in the nightshade family. So those aren't. I would never plant those back to back, or you might start seeing problems with with blight and uh, different types of bacterial fun and fungal things. Um, eggplants are also in that family. What else? Onions. Onions too, right, yep. Any, I, so my rule of thumb is that root crops, I won't follow with another root crop for at least three years. So like potatoes and garlic and onions as we grow a lot of, like it's hard for me because I, you know, I'm so tight there. Um, I put cover crops in after MF4 every harvest just to keep, keep something different in there. But it's, it's certainly a challenge. So the same family, the same type of plant, is kind of what I tend to go for. Yeah. Did, did you have a question also? Yeah, I'm just wondering where I could buy things like vetch seed or white clover. Cresalia. Oh, um, I should, I had, okay. Um, you can buy a lot of those grains like at, um, say like your local Synex. They, they'll oftentimes have like a, just you can tell them that you want, um, a grain or like some sort of seed for a cover crop and usually they have an agronomist on hand or they they kind of know enough to kind of point you in the right direction um, hairy vetch is a pretty common one um, a hay barley or a hay oat or a winter wheat those are grasses that are pretty common um, and then phacelia is one that's not super common but you can get it online I get um, uh, Westland Seed has Phacelia as well because I just asked them to. <laughs> when you pass through it, it wouldn't hurt <laughs> to go in there. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden they're going to have this boom of Phacelia. <laughs> oh, so we were getting so much seed from them. They built bins for us um, because we, we, they've got these little self service bins that, yeah. that drop seed out that's really handy. Um, and so Fall Rye is the one, Buckweed's one, Radishes are one. The ones we kind of use, the, our bread and butter ones. Did you have a question, David? Okay. Oh, okay. Lean it last time. Okay. Yeah. If you plant your buckwheat and rye as a cover crop, are you or are you not letting it go seed? Well, with rye and buckwheat, those are ones that um, buckwheat's pretty wimpy. Like if it gets a whiff of frost, it it dies pretty quickly. With rye, like cereal rye, if it goes to seed, it can be it can it it'll probably definitely germinate. The next opportunity it gets, it's it's pretty hardy, but it also germinates super quickly. So it has these benefits, um, and it takes a little time for that seed head to like harden and become viable. Uh, it has to cure out. So um, there's certain ones like those I just steer clear of, but um, they may not be an issue. They're pretty easy to pull. Um, fall rye or cereal rye is super easy to weed. 
Um, but when you have a lot of it, it just gets it's just more on the list to do is to weed when it's in like your potatoes or something. So um, yeah, it might not be an issue for you. I mean, like I don't mind seeing veg. She would ever use that as a double crop. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Harvest. That's a great. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I know with fava beans, I like to have those in a mix too because. Um, they're delicious and they fix a lot of nitrogen uh, fava beans do um, I want to encourage you to pull up the roots of these things and just see what the roots look like because they're really cool you'll see nodules on them those are the bacteria and like the plant bacteria symbionts there um, that's where the nitrogen that's where the magic is in the roots so okay I probably have talked way too much <laughs> thanks for coming though. I just